With all the progress that's been made on issues of race and equality, some Americans see racism as a problem of the past. Some recent polling has, in fact, shown that almost half of Americans think that discrimination against whites is just as prevalent as discrimination against blacks and other minorities. But anti-racism author and activist Tim Wise is pushing back. He's exploring the subject in a new film called White Like Me. Let's take a look at the trailer. When it comes to race, we've overcome quite a lot in this country. Slavery. Civil War. Segregation. We've even elected a black man to the highest office in the land. Change has come to America. But as tempting as it might be to celebrate these things as signs that we've entered into a period of colorblind post-racial harmony. We have to admit that we're moving forward in this world and that race issues are moving to the periphery. I think those problems are largely behind us. The fact is, racial inequalities still exist. Today, there are more African Americans in prison or jail, on probation or parole, than were enslaved in 1850, a decade before the Civil War began. And racial bias still affects the way we view others. And when we fail to recognize that, we not only continue to do an injustice to people of color, we end up doing damage to white folks as well. We're pleased now to have the author of White Like Me, Tim Wise, join us right now. Tim, good to see you. Good to see you. Always good to see you, yes, brother. And in the hangout, we're also joined by Jared Taylor. Uh, he's a journalist and advocate for racial realism. He'll talk about what that means later. Matthew Heimbach is a Townsend University student, and he is the creator of the White Student Union. And we're joined by the eminent professor, Michael Eric Dyson. He's a professor of sociology at Georgetown University. We're gonna to go to the Hangout a little bit later, but first, Tim, I wanna spend some time sure. with you. Talk to me, first of all, about this documentary. Why was it necessary for you to make it? Well, I just think right now, uh, particularly ever since the election of President Obama, there's been this constant narrative, and it's been coming from people on the right, but also, to some extent, white liberal folks uh, as well, yeah. that race is really an issue that's behind us, that we're living in this post-racial era, and I've written you know, three books sort of pushing back on that concept, but I think that sometimes, uh, particularly in this generation, to have a multimedia presence presentation that really demonstrates the realities of ongoing institutional race, racism and racial inequality, the reality of ongoing material and psychological white privilege advantages to those of us in the dominant group uh, is, is helpful. It, it does something that a book can't do. And so really I take all of the analysis of my four or five books and I sort of synthesize those into the film to make the point that not only are we not living in a post-racial era, but in some ways institutional inequity, particularly in terms of wealth gaps between whites and blacks, whites and Latinos, are actually getting worse, not better. Uh, right now, the typical white family, 20 times the net worth of the typical black family, 18 times that of the typical Latino family. That has actually gotten worse in recent years. So we have to have that discussion. Uh, and, and I think a lot of times in this country, we don't have it. Why are we having that discussion? Well, on the one hand, you know, I make this point in the film and in my Books, white Americans have never really wanted to confront the reality of racism. Even in the early 60s, there's a clip in the film where uh, they, they go out and they talk to white folks on the streets in 1962, 1963, and ask them about the civil rights bill that was pending at the time or about yeah. the March on Washington. And these white folks are like, well, I don't see what all the fuss is about. And actually, Gallup polls, even then, before the Civil Rights Act was even passed, found that most white folks thought blacks had fully equal opportunity in housing, yeah. education, employment. So white denial has been a long-standing problem. That, because that's country. an interesting yeah. point you're making here. It wasn't that yeah. they said we don't want black people to have equal access. In the moment yeah. where black people clearly didn't have pu uh, public White accommodations, civil rights, right. they still said it's there. Right, 1963, keep in mind what, 50 years ago now, right? That year is the year of the March on Washington. It's the year of the bombing at the church in Birmingham. It's the year that Medgar Evers is shot down dead in his driveway in Jackson by a white supremacist. So racism is all around. It's on the news every night. You can't avoid seeing it. And yet, two out of three whites in a Gallup poll that year, actually, no, more than that, 85% of white Americans that year told Gallup that black children had just as good a chance to get a good education as white children. Now, in retrospect, we can look at that and go, my God, that's like delusional, but I think it's very telling because what it tells you is that even good people, and I think most of those white folks were good people. I don't think they were bigots or hateful people, but I think they couldn't see what was in front of them because to be white in 1963, and I would argue still today, is to have the luxury, the privilege, if you will, of not having to know black and brown truth. You can be oblivious 
to the reality of people of color and suffer no consequence. On the other hand, to be a person of color, you have to learn white folks stuff. You have to know the rules that white folks have created in order to survive in that society. So in school, you're going to learn white literature and white history and white theater. They're not going to call it that, but that's the point of privilege. You don't have to racially name the stuff that's considered normal and normative. And that's really what white privilege is about. It's being able to take certain things for granted, not just opportunities, but also just the narrative of the society itself. You've said the word white yeah. more times in this segment than probably any white person that's ever been on this show right. put together, right? right? You name whiteness, you put a spotlight on whiteness in a way that other people don't. Why are you committed to doing that? Why is that so important? Well, I think a lot of times when we do talk about race, even when liberal folks talk about race, we make it seem as if it's just a black person's issue or a Latino issue or an Asian issue or a Native American issue. Um, but the truth is, if it's an issue for people of color, then the flip side is what we also have to examine. Uh, I make this point in, in a lot of my writing and my speeches. You can't have a down without an up, right? right? So if people of color are discriminated against in housing two to three million times a year, according to the best estimates we have, that's two to three million more opportunities for housing for white people. In other words, some people are down, there are advantages for others. If, if black folks here in New York are being stopped and frisked 2.8 million times over a five-year period, as we've learned in the current trial uh, yeah. where the NYPD has basically been put on trial. 2.8 million times, hardly any of them arrested for anything because hardly any of them have actually committed a crime. But white folks here in this city, for instance, when we're walking around, even if we do have drugs on us, even if we use drugs and sell drugs, and the data says white folks do that at the very same rates as the rates that black and brown folks do, we have the luxury of knowing we're not going to be suspected. We're not going to be searched. We're not not going to be frisked. We're not likely to be arrested. We're not going to jail. I think unless we talk about the upside of the racial structure, not just the down, we're being dishonest. We're only looking at one half of the puzzle. One, you mentioned trials. Another trial that's been big, obviously, in the last month has been the trial of George Zimmerman, right. which some would argue has turned into the trial of Trayvon Martin, the trial of Rachel yeah. Gentile, the trial yeah. of everybody else but George Zimmerman. Yeah, yeah. How does a trial like that speak to the issues you talk about in your documentary? Well, I think it, it does in a lot of ways. One of the things we talk about in the film is that racial profile and the criminal justice system is probably the greatest single area or arena of, of, of racial privilege. It's knowing, for instance, that if on that night in February when George Zimmerman uh, shot uh, uh, Trayvon Martin, had Trayvon Martin been Trevor Martin, a white guy in a hoodie, uh, walking around in the rain, wearing a hoodie in the rain, imagine that, right. trying to stay dry, the odds that George Zimmerman would have viewed him in a racially negative or hostile way would be far less. I can't say for sure he wouldn't have followed him, but the reality is here's a guy who has is called police in that community on numerous occasions. Whenever he sees a black male, a nine-year-old black kid was in the neighborhood once and George Zimmerman called the cops on him because he assumed he was up to no good. Would he do that to a nine-year-old white child, to a 13-year-old, to a 16-year-old or 17-year-old white male? The odds are no. Why? Does that mean George Zimmerman is a horrible racist? I'm not, I'm not saying that. I wouldn't say that. I don't know him personally enough to make that comment. But I do know that the racialized suspicions that we have when we see someone who is black are very different from the suspicions we have when we see someone who was white, whether that's someone on the street or whether that's a terrorist. You know, you think about the Boston bombing. And once it was discovered that these guys were, yes, Muslim, but uh, not only white, but literally from the Caucasus Mountain region. <laughs> right. they are, they are, the anthro Caucasian they, they are the most Caucasian people <laughs> like in the country right, right now. And, and yet Islam has been racialized to such an extent. People didn't know what to make of that. That's also white privilege. It's knowing that you can have hundreds, and I actually listed on my website an article, 153 white, presumably Christian by their own claims right. terrorist in the last 30 years in this country and almost none of them stick in the public imagination as terrorists why because white folks when we act in, in negative ways whether it's crime street crime whether it's terrorism whether it's drug use whatever it is our sins our foibles if you will don't get racialized and that's what the film tries to address and what I think the George Zimmerman situation speaks to as well comment comes in from Brooks Bain says wise isn't white he's Jewish trust me he doesn't present a white paradigm. Well, this is going to be fun because since you have Jared and Matt on, we're going to get into a conversation, I'm sure, because white nationalists, including the one who's just uh, sent you this, have a hard time, I guess, getting their head around the fact that whiteness is a social construct, not a genetic or biological reality. So am I Jewish? Yes. It's not like that's a secret. I've talked about that. Sometimes Nazis and white supremacists will say that like they're outing me. Right. Uh, that's and about, I don't know if Brooks Bain is a Nazi or a white supremacist. Well, I actually don't know who that I is. I will tell you that when people say he's not white, he's Jewish, it is usually the case that they're operating from a very narrow white nationalist perspective that believes, as Hitler did, that Jews are a biological 
multiple subspecies, totally non-white, uh, Asiatic subspecies bent on destroying the white race. Jared has people in his movement who feel that way. He tries to keep them in line because that's not the script he prefers, as I'm sure he'll tell you. But uh, the reality is, uh, I've talked about being Jewish. Being Jewish, however, does nothing to prevent the fact that in this society, I am racialized as white when I apply for jobs, when I'm walking down the street, when I'm trying to get a cab, like I'm gonna get a cab when we leave here, right? right. I'm gonna be able to do that. The cabbie may not like Jews, but he's not gonna look at me and say, oh, Jew. He's gonna look at me and say, white guy, not a black guy, I think I'll pick him up. We know that's how racial profiling works with, with taxi cabs. So I am Jewish because I was raised Jewish and because I have one parent who's Jewish and one grandparent who's Jewish, but I'm white because we live in a society where whiteness is not about your DNA, your genetics, your biology. It never was, just like blackness is not. It's about what you are viewed as by people in positions of authority. If employers, if cops, if bankers, if landlords look at me and see a white person and look at someone else and see a black person, that's what ends up mattering in this Absolutely. country. And that's why I, I, I talk about whiteness, because whiteness is what I receive in the culture. We have an amazing hangout of people here. We have, again, Jared Taylor, we have Matthew Heinbach, and we have Professor Michael Eric Dyson. I want to bring them into the conversation. Now, all three of you have heard a bunch of stuff. I'm sure you want to jump in. I'm sure you have comments. I'm sure you have questions. Uh, and I'm going to uh, place some other issues on the table as well. But I'm going to start with you, uh, Matthew. You've heard uh, what Tim Wise has said. Any, any initial response? Well, I mean, first of all, I would say on his claim that Jewishness and whiteness are inherently the same thing, I would say that a copperhead looks like a wood pile, but it's not. Just because something looks like something doesn't mean that it is. And Mr. Wise is perhaps one of the largest and most effective anti-white bigots currently out there on the anti-racist circuit who is doing everything he can to promote the extinction of my race and removing us from our place in our society. As he said in one recent article, tick tock, tick tock, that your time is coming. It's, it's basic math, third grade math, I think you said, Mr. Wise, saying that white folks are losing our, our grip on this country and are losing our ability to organize for ourselves. And folks like you are the ones who are bigots, who are anti-white, and yes, you are Jewish, not white, are the ones who are promoting this. And you are well, actually calling for my genocide. Absolutely absurd. Well, here's the thing. First of all, the article that he references is an open letter to white conservatives. And the point was, after the midterm elections in 2010, I was saying, enjoy your success right now. Tick tock. Your time is coming when white, the white right will not be able to maintain control of this country. It was not a call for white genocide. It was not a call for any genocide, as anyone who is a college student at Towson ought to be able to know. If I was so calling for white genocide, I would be calling. Wait a minute. I, so so oh, wait, by, second, by that logic, by that logic, I would be calling for the genocide of my wife my two children, the old lady who lives across the street, all of them wonderful were you, people were you who are white. Were you suggesting that white Americans won't exist demographically no, in the same not. way? No, the argument I was making was, and we know this is true, that white Americans will no longer be an absolute majority in about 30 years. And I was making the point that I think when that day comes, it will be better for democracy because people of color and white folks will have to work together to forge a multiracial democracy. We're not going to be able to survive with this sort of white nationalist mentality that people like Matthew, people like Jared and others would like to, to maintain in the culture. So he ultimately misread the article. I think most of the white nationalists did it on purpose. Uh, the idea that be, and it's sort of ironic, the idea that criticizing white racism makes you anti-white is a really interesting thing because by that logic, in order to be pro-white, you would have to be a white racist. I mean, that's the basic math. That seems absurd to me. My, I don't my think question that to be is, why wouldn't whites want to be able to maintain control? It's ridiculous to think whether you're a liberal, conservative, <clears throat> black, Hispanic, white, why wouldn't you be able to have the majority and be able to be able to support your people. Why should any group have to have a majority in order to maintain its, its, well, its yeah, access Mr. Wise, to society? As someone who advocated for the ANC government when you were a college student, supporting right. Nelson Mandela, who set bombs and was a terrorist, I, I really don't think, let's ask, actually, I have the Transvaal Republic flag on my shirt. Let's ask the Boers and the Afrikaners how this uh, multiracial democracy is working out for them. I well, don't think it's going very well. So, so, Matthew, just so that I'm clear, and then I want to move on to Professor Dyson. In your estimation, the right response would have been to support the Afrikaners movement and oppose Nelson Mandela in South Africa? I would say yes, because Nelson Mandela, again, he was offered to be released from prison if he would renounce violence, and he wouldn't do it. I say the Church Street bombing alone is a reason why someone should be kept in jail for the rest of their life. Terrorism is not the answer to problems within a society. This, coming from, somebody, this coming from somebody who defends a political movement of white nationalism that has historically used the most incredible violence to conquer this entire continent and to enslave others and to eliminate indigenous people, lecturing people of color about violence, I find that precious. 
I want, I want to bring Professor Dyson in uh, because we could, we could pursue this line on its own probably for a half hour. Professor Dyson, you've been hearing a lot over the last uh, 15 minutes or so, and I'm sure you have a lot to add here. Uh, but I want to start with this question about whiteness. And, and there was an interesting article that came up in the Huff Post here. Can we bring this up, guys? Uh, white, white History Month floats stirs controversy at July 4th parade. There seems to be, at the same time that pe people are beginning to talk about racism more, again, there's a resurgence of conversations about white supremacy. People like Tim are uh, trying to put a spotlight on, on white privilege. There is a counter push from many white people who are saying, wait, what about White History Month? Wait a minute, what about white rights? What about the right of white people, as, as Matthew said, to be a majority? How do you make sense of that kind of pushback in the era of not just Obama, but in the era of this re renewed conversation? Well, uh, 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 Brother Mark, I, I thank you for having me on. I, I, my, I'm tempted to say I yield my time to uh, Tim Wise. I want him to have as much to say <laughs> as possible, because the reality is for our two guests in particular, they're going to hear a Tim Wise far more than they hear your brilliance or my insight. Having said that, um, the reality is that, uh, look, whiteness has been equivalent to universality in our culture, that which is seen as normal, that which is seen as true that which is seen as beautiful, that which is seen as something that is, you know, helpful and not harmful. So when whiteness has been considered equivalent to all the good stuff and everything else that falls outside beyond literally the pale of whiteness is seen as somehow pathological and non-productive, then you have people like Brother Matthew and like Brother Jared uh, who may be defensive about whiteness because they think it's erosion, the erosion of whiteness, a symbolic capital in which they've invested, as Mr. Wise has pointed out there, that the erosion of whiteness means the erosion of their humanity because their whiteness and their humanity has been made equivalent. But what I think the best of the anti-racist movement has been about, especially from white Americans, is to dislodge and disassociate whiteness with humanity and talk about the fact that these things, when he says a social construct, that means you ain't born with an inherent sense of what it means to be white or black or red or brown in this country. You await the society in which you live to give you meaning. So when you ask me the question, why is this stuff popping off now? Well, when you have the perception that Obama, when you look at it in terms of empirical numbers, we ain't got but one president out of 44, all right? Okay, he's half white, 43 and a half. You've got... <laughs> You know, the heads of major 500, you know, Forbes 500 cor corporations, uh, not many black people. When you talk about who runs American educational system, not many black. So when you, when you, we've already got the numbers that Mr. Wise has given us about home ownership, uh, disproportionate incarceration and the like. When you look at the situation for African-American and other minority people in this country, we ain't got a foothold in most of the economic pies of American society. We don't run stuff. We run jails in the sense of our numbers. We are over incarcerated because of nonviolent drug offenses. So the perception of whiteness as paranoia, panic, and to the response of somehow feeling that they are being eroded, that they are being displaced, that they are no longer central. The control that they used to e exercise in American culture by virtue of force and, I think, Brother Matthew, by terror. What is it but terror when you blow up a church? Not the 6th Street bomb, the 16th Street bombing when white men bombed black children or when a white man went around bragging about killing Medgar Evers. These are acts of racial terror in the context of America that have never been punished because the punishment was associated with blackness. So I think now to end, Mark, the reality is, is that the perception of white paranoia and panic in response to black progress, as limited as it has been, suggests to, to uh, white supremacists and white nationalists and white purists that their day is over, that the day the rule, reign, and tyranny of white supremacy and white logic has been eroded, and now what we've got to come to grips with is the fact we got to make arguments based upon our reason and upon our political cogency and not because of power. And I think that leads to a kind of paranoia in many whites, besides the ones we have on the program here today. I, I, I appreciate that insight. Jared, I want to give you an opportunity to respond to that. I'm, I'm sure you have a lot to say. Uh, one of the things here, though, that's come up is this idea of white panic, this idea of white paranoia, and this idea that perhaps white people uh, have an anxiety about losing the country, so to speak. And we heard a lot of that, that talk in the, in the uh, age of Obama. How do you make sense of this, of this moment in terms of that, that key point? 
Well, I find it very interesting that on the one hand, white people are suffering from paranoia and panic, and then at the same time, they're apparently enjoy, uh, enjoying white privilege. It seems to me that you guys at least ought to get your story straight. <laughs> obviously, obviously, white people have been the majority in this country for a long time, and if current trends continue, they will cease to be the majority. They're told over and over and over again that they should celebrate diversity. What I would like to know is why white people should be celebrating their dwindling numbers and decreasing influence. Only fools could be tricked into thinking that that is something to celebrate. And I would, I would defy you to find any non-white country in which the majority, if it were threatened, could be tricked into thinking in those terms. Finally, as far as uh, the fact that there are more black people in jail per capita than white people, there's a very, very simple explanation for that. It's for the, it's for the same reason there are more men in jail than women in jail. Black people per capita to commit more crimes than white people, men commit more crimes per capita than women. And uh, there's one thing, though, that I would certainly agree with Mr. Weiss about. There's no such thing as a post-racial America. I think there will never be a post-racial America. Race is a biological fact. The idea that it is somehow a sociological optical illusion, that idea is so wrong and so stupid that only very intelligent people can persuade themselves that it's true. The fact is, race is a natural identification that we all feel. And any attempt to build a multiracial society will be plagued but, by this natural identification of race. Here's what's the only difference is, in the United States, whites have been forbidden to express any kind of natural identification by race. All of this business about white privilege, what a bunch of baloney. It certainly didn't well, save James Watson when all he suggested was that there may be biological reasons that blacks are less intelligent than whites. Mark, <laughs> out the door. You know, Same for Jason Richwine. Where was white privilege? privilege? Where was white protection, white power, when he suggested that people immigrating to this country should be judged perhaps on the basis of well, IQ? White, white no, privilege isn't going, really Mark, nonsense. white privilege isn't going to keep a white person in their job when they say something that's racist or offensive to the people who employ them. That's not <laughs> well, going to protect you from every single job. What it is going to do, however, is mean that if you're an African American with a college degree, you're still going to be twice as likely as a white person with a degree to be out of work. If you're Latino or Asian with a degree in this country, you're 40 to 50 percent more likely than whites with a degree to be out of work. It means that white men 25 to 34 are going to earn on average one third more than black men 55 to 64 who have more experience in the workforce. It's not going to mean that every single competition is going to be won by a white person. It means that on balance, it still pays in the labor force, in the justice system, in the school system, in the housing market to be white. And I should point out with regard to Jared's argument about criminality, keep in mind a disproportionate amount of the increased incarceration in the last 30 years, as we talk about in the film, is from the war on drugs. The data on that is overwhelming. There is no statistically significant difference between the rates at which whites, blacks, and Latinos use drugs, but there is a five to nine times greater rate of incarceration for black people for drug use. So white folks are doing the crime just as often among young whites, actually more often according to the CDC, but it's black and brown folks who are being stopped and arrested. So Jared's argument about incarceration simply mirroring crime rates is absolutely untrue with regard let's, to let's the let's drug Let's let him respond to that, Jared. Jared, Jared that's an interesting point. Though. I mean, there's certainly significant uh, data to suggest that even when you control for outside factors, when whites and blacks do the exact same thing, there's a different uh, criminal outcome, a different social outcome. Uh, how do you make sense if of you, that? I make sense of it this way. Mr. Weiss is telling you about blacks and whites with degrees. He's not telling you what kind of degrees. He's not telling you the white might have a degree in computer science or a degree in astronomy, and the black person has a degree in black studies. If you really do a fine-grained analysis and you're really comparing proper apples to apples, you'll find that often a black person gets an advantage because there's such a thing called affirmative action in this country. The Supreme Court, in fact, just pronounced that, yes, diversity, meaning racial diversity, meaning discrimination against whites, is considered a national good, a national interest. It's worth discriminating against white people to get diversity in this but, country. But, Mark, here's the white fact people, about that on, case. Hold on, that... let me finish. Let me finish. White people are the only group that the government can officially discriminate against. To some extent, Asians are also victims of this, too. But in order to promote less qualified Hispanics and blacks, you are officially allowed, you're even encouraged to discriminate against whites. Now, 
Tell First. me more baloney about white privilege. Well, here's the thing. He mentioned the Supreme Court case about affirmative action, Abigail Fisher down in Texas. Here's what's interesting about that case. She claims to have been the white victim of reverse discrimination. When you actually look at the data, you find out there were only five people of color the year that she was rejected from UT who had lower grades and scores than her, but nonetheless got in. So to her, that was this horrible injustice. Oh my God, I was the victim of reverse discrimination. The same year, there were like 50 other uh, people, excuse me, 50 other white folks with lower grades and scores than her who also got in. She didn't complain about that. And there were over a hundred black and Latino kids who were rejected just like she was, even though they had better grades and scores than her. So when she claims to be the victim of reverse discrimination, she doesn't even have the basic facts of her own case correct. That speaks to Jared's argument. It's just not well, true. I gotta move on, guys. I only have, I literally only have about two minutes left. Uh, Professor Dyson, I want to ask you a question uh, that many people have pondered, and that is, if we begin to highlight white privilege, and you're a university professor, we even have areas of inquiry called whiteness studies. If we continue to put all this spotlight on whiteness, do we actually undermine the project of, of actually creating racial equality? In other words, we're just talking about white people again. Yeah, well, there, there can be a subversive narcissism involved in some of this, but thank God for people like Tim Wise and others who are vigilant about critiquing themselves, about asking the question, about being full partners with other people of color and other similarly minded, democratically inclined white Americans um, to really come to a point where we don't celebrate or elevate anybody above anybody else, but the best man or woman wins. So the reality is that when we talk about whiteness studies, it's a painful process to come to consciousness. Carl Gustav Jung said there's no true birth of consciousness without pain. And the painful birth process we see of white America rebirthing itself, coming to a new consciousness is, 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 uh, is, is unmistakable. But the reality is, Mark, is that we've got to focus on how we deal with the consequences of whiteness wherever we find them. When, when, when Tim Wise says to Jared Taylor, look, it ain't that black people do more drugs, that Latino people do more drugs, it's the fact that they get caught more because they're being, suspicious, they're being suspected more. That's something that even the naysayers against so-called anti-racism and the proponents of white supremacy have no answer for, because the bottom line is many mediocre drug adult kids go to school, I teach some of them, <laughs> uh, they're wonderful young people, but they don't get the same kind of uh, stigma and pathology associated with them, with them as even well-achieving, high-minded African-American, Latino, well, and other students. I got to bring Matthew in because then we have to run. Matthew, there's a comment that came in from Kathy Sandrew. She said, Matthew is the prime example of why we are not a post-racial society. Anyway, we all originate from Africa, including whites, so his point is ridiculous. I bet if you trace his DNA, you will find African roots. Matthew, I don't know if that point disturbs you or not. But, but, but either way, I'm, I guess what I wonder is, at the core, do you, do you see any value in, in saying, look, we all do originate from the same place. We all are African at the core, and maybe holding on to whiteness isn't as valuable as I may have thought it was. Well, no, whiteness, I mean, it's part of my identity. It's my race. It's, it's my blood. It's my honor. And the, the thing about Mr. Wise, I think it's very interesting. The facts apparently are racist, because like, like Mr. Taylor said, ask Jason Richwine about what the facts did. He could prove it, got his PhD from Harvard, and that, the facts apparently weren't enough. And, Professor, I really do just think it's interesting when we talk about this which, white which privilege. Fact, which facts? I have, I have Matthew, the which, Ma Matthew, hold on, Please slow down. Me. Matthew, Matthew, which facts? I just want you to be clear so we can... Well, when you look at crime rates, look at the National uh, Crime Victim Survey that's done every single year by the federal government. It actually proves that you could look, look in Mr. Taylor's book, White Identity, where it shows from the government statistics, when you take anonymous surveys of American citizens, when they say what they've been a victim of a crime and who's the perpetrator, incarceration rates are consistent with black and Hispanic men committing more violent crimes. And but, that is but done incarceration not with some sort of agenda. Nothing that is a survey that. Matthew, Matthew, we're, Matthew, Matthew, once again, we're, we're talking, talking about the war on drugs, Matthew, drugs. That has nothing to do with violent crime. These guys have now avoided for the last 15 minutes the point I made, which is that stop and frisk is not about violent crime. Drugs. Stop and frisk no. is not about violent crime. Only 15% of the stops in New York are ever written down as being even searching for a weapon or a violent crime. It's usually for loitering or it's for drug possession. And if whites commit okay. that Let's crime at the same rate, white folks should be getting stopped at the same rate. We are not let getting me, stopped at the same rate. Let, that is let, white we're, 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 we have, I, Let I, I, me address that very point. Let me address well, that. Jared, I would love for you to, I promise I'll have you back, but we have to, we have to actually run. Uh, there's a white woman waiting to do her segment next, and I want to make sure she gets all, Get all the room. privileges that she deserves. Um, Tim, thank you for joining yeah. us. This documentary comes out when? About a month to six weeks from now. About a month, six weeks from now.
Uh, this documentary comes out. It's called White Like Me. It's an incredible documentary that will lay out all of these issues. In fact, I believe Jared and Matthew were featured in it and many of their friends as well. It'll be an interesting conversation. The conversation here always continues. So please stay with us at HuffPost Live. Caitlin Becker's up next.